I think it's time, however, for the next speaker. I can switch back here. Stop sharing. Gallery. All right. So can I introduce Andreas Lockbieler, who will be talking, as we can see, about authenticated data structures. Thanks for the intro, um, Larry. So this is uh, joint work with Ognion. We're both uh, working at Digital Asset on a distributed ledger uh, architecture by using a uh, smart contract language that I call demo and a synchronization protocol for Canton. And this is also where the, the whole work originates from. So um, let's let's see what is what is a distributed ledger in that case. So in, in our understanding, the main value, um, some of you may have heard about distributed ledgers, various things, but in our understanding, the main value is that um, they basically provide a concept of a shared database abstraction. And that shared database is shared between different organizations. Now, shared databases have been around for a long time. What's, what's the new thing? Well, the idea is basically that we have different uh, trust assumptions. So with a distributed ledger, you basically have your trust boundaries run right across the database. In that view, um, a smart contract is basically defining the data schema for the data that you store in the contract, along with the stored procedures that describe how you evolve them. So why is this uh, trust boundary stuff important? And why does this help? Well, suppose organization one wants to do business with organization two, then they would like to have like a shared single source of truth for the data that affects both of them, like organization one, uh, owing a certain amount of money to organization two. And at the same time, organization two say wants to connect um, this uh, outstanding bill with some internal data that should be uh, only available to that organization. And that's why the trust boundaries run through the database. Now, of course, that's just a nice abstraction. Um, the actual implementation looks like slightly differently. Um, what you get is basically every organization still keeps their own database. And then they run a synchronization protocol uh, between them. And what you pick as synchronization protocol um, depends on your use case. Uh, the term distributed ledger came essentially up as part of the Bitcoin and blockchain movement where you use a blockchain that's replicated across uh, all these three organizations. The problem with blockchains is that it's not really a good fit to uh, share database because you run into scalability problems as everyone has to process everything. Um, you run into uh, regulatory compliance problems because if you think of data projection laws, um, you want to be able to erase data, but that's not something blockchain was built for. And then there's also the privacy aspect that organization two wants to keep some of their data private. Um, you can only achieve that by doing a certain second layer blockchains on top of these kind of things. So people are looking into that. Or the alternative is to use a plain synchronization protocol, and this is what Canton is, and this is um, where this work started from. So as the running, or one example that you'll, that you'll see here is um, how does Canton work? Suppose we have a smart contract for car deals, and here we're looking at Alice and Bob executing a car purchase. So Alice wants to buy Bob's car. And suppose we have codified up this workflow as a smart contract that we then feed um, into the demo runtime. So it must be written in our uh, smart contract language based on Haskell. It's basically Haskell with a domain specific language primitives for reasoning about rights and obligations that arise in business workflows. So the output of the whole thing of these uh, domain-specific uh, constructions is a hierarchical transaction that we see here on the left. Um, it consists of two parts. Bob handing over the ownership of the car to Alice, and that's modeled by including the Department for Motor Vehicles, who records the ownerships of the car. And on the other hand, we've got essentially tokenized money, and Alice instructs the bank to wire the money to Bob. 
Now, these two legs of the uh, execution of the contract, we would like to execute them atomically, and this is where the name transaction comes from. So why atomically? Well, if we do both, then uh, in, in a single transaction, then neither Bob nor Ellis can end up without a car and without the money. So um, it reduces the counterparty risk. And the whole thing is hierarchical because, um, well, wiring money from Alice to Bob is a perfectly uh, isolated uh, transaction that we could have executed on our own. So if we want to build complex workflows, we can start with simple ones and then aggregate them in such a hierarchical structure. The hierarchical structure also gives us a way to think about um, visibility. So we could say, well, the wiring involves Alice, Bob, and bank. So that part should be visible to those three. But a bank doesn't need to know anything about the card transfer. And in fact, the bank shouldn't really learn what uh, Alice uh, buys from Bob for the money that she's wiring. So that second leg of the transaction should be visible to the bank, but I said to the DMV. And the big thing would only be visible to Bob. Now, Again, as I said, this is a synchronization protocol, so we need some implementation. Um, the Canton protocol that we've uh, developed is basically a two-phase commit protocol with a commit coordinator uh, ensuring the atomicity and the privacy of the individual uh, parties that are involved in the transaction, so the privacy of uh, the bank that it need not be known to the DMV and vice versa. And well, but other than that, the commit coordinator doesn't need to learn the business details. So in particular, the commit coordinator shouldn't see what concrete instructions Alice and Bob put into this sub-transaction. They will only see here's a black box and Alice, Bob, and the bank need to be involved in this part. And in order to implement that, um, we're using heavily authenticated data structures. And that's where um, we're getting into what this uh, talk is about, namely authenticated data structures, such as a trans transaction on the right hand side. It's basically to start out data arranged in some sort of tree. So you can think of an algebraic data type in that sense, with two interesting extra features. The first thing is a digest. And the digest essentially allows you to create a short reference to the transaction as a whole, to the tree as a whole. With the nice property that anyone who knows, say, a part of the tree, like the bank knowing the left leg, can actually prove to anyone that this leg is part of what the digest refers to. So we have a kind of cryptographic structure running here. And Sometimes inclusion proofs are also called Merkle proofs um, because that's the Merkle tree is the, uh, the, the, the typical structure uh, type of an authenticated data structure, but we can do it more general. And precisely this more general approach is what um, will be this talk about. Um, I'm gonna tell you how uh, you can, we can embed shallowly such authenticated data structures in, into uh, higher order logic, including a bunch of operations that we want to have um, on those trays along with their properties. Now, shallow embedding means um, we're gonna define those things as data types uh, in whole and can just work with them, use the function package to define things on top of that. Um, there's been related work, Dmitri and um, Matthias Brun, uh, last year at ITP presented a deep embedding of uh, authenticated data structures, more precisely a um, lambda calculus with authentication primitives and proved certain meta-theoretical soundness properties around them. Um, that's not what we're gonna be, uh, go after because we want to look at concrete examples and prove concrete results about those uh, examples rather than general results. Um, as we all know, internalizing a logic um, or internalizing such statements into a deep embedding is hard work. So 
this shallow embedding as part of uh, on the road there will see a new class of what we call Merkle functors, which are the building blocks um, from which we can get a modular construction. And then we've applied the whole thing um, to work with Canton and those trades, and you'll see that's a non-trivial example. One caveat for those who uh, are averse to symbolic cryptography, you have to tune out now. Um, we're basically assuming that cryptographic operations are perfect, as is still commonplace uh, if you do symbolic protocol analysis. Um, so in our case, this basically means we're assuming that there are no hash collisions, or in other words, the hash function is injected. And we'll see where that comes into play. So um, the running example for uh, on the slides will be a slightly simpler thing than the Canton transaction trace. Uh, namely just a binary tree with uh, leaves being labeled. So here we have such an example with uh, the atoms one, two, three, four, five at the leaves. Now, what is the digest of that thing of such a tree? And let's assume that um, we want to be able to authenticate every um, position in that tree. So we start out with uh, the atoms and then construct a hash tree from that. So Let's hash the atoms using a hash function. And what now happens is every inner node is essentially replaced by um, taking the hash of the two children and putting that again through a hash function. And now we can build that up. And once we arrive at the root, we have the digest. And that is an, a reference, an unambiguous reference to that data structure if we assume that there are no hash collisions because each such data structure, um, each different data structure would give a different digest. And how do inclusion proofs work? Well, inclusion proofs proves that a certain position contains a certain data. So if we're given that proof or that structure, and we hand that to uh, someone over, it's very easy to verify that this inclusion proof refers to this data structure because if we know what the digest of the data structure is, because we can just repeat the computation uh, of the hashes and we end, if we end up with the same digest, we, end, uh, we know that this inclusion proof refers to that digest and therefore to the same data structure. So if we have multiple inclusion proofs, people can start talking about the same data structure without actually knowing what is underneath here because also, of course, we said hash is an injective function. In practice, we can't invert that. So computationally, it's a one-way function. Now, we don't have to restrict ourselves to prove inclusion of a single position. We can prove inclusion for a multiple position at the same time. And the question then is, how do we define a type for the hash trees and for the inclusion proofs? In a general approach, and for hash trees, I'll use the subscript M. And for inclusion proofs, I'll use the subscript M. Sorry, hashes are H, inclusion proofs M. And along with the systematic derivation of the operations and theorems. So I'll focus mostly on the inclusion proofs here because they're the richest structure among the three. It's easy to go back to the data structure if we invert the hash, which is possible due to it being injected. And it's also very easy to go from an inclusion proof to a hash proof. So let's focus on inclusion proofs. And there are two operations that we consider. The hash, which computes the hash of a digest, which we use to verify that the inclusion proof refers to something. And the other part is a partial merge operation, where you take two inclusion proofs and get one that aggregates the information that's contained in the two. And then there's just a locale that defines uh, the properties that we want to have. So of course, the type of inclusion proofs includes uh, inclusion proofs for different trees, and they may have, they should have different root hashes. So we don't expect to merge the information in, in such, such a thing. And therefore the merging should respect the hashes, meaning if you have inclusion, uh, if the digests are the same, you should be able to merge that and vice versa. And other than that, merge is basically a idempotent commutative and associative operation on inclusion proofs. So we have a semi structure on 
inclusion proofs, and this will be very powerful to, to reason about this uh, and to work about that. It also induces an order on inclusion proofs, and I'll return to that a bit later. So that is all about data, uh, authenticated data structures. Now, um, we also had functors in the title. So for those who no, don't know them out of uh, their head, so what is a functor? Well, basically, a functor takes a set of atoms, like one, two, three, and builds some values, some structured values on top of those. Um, here we have binary trees with those atoms at the leaves. And the functor does that systematically. So if we pick a different um, base set, we get a different set of trees with different atoms in there. And what's the functor? The interesting part of the functor is that if you have a function that goes from one set to the other, then there is a systematic way you lift that function over um, to those sets. And that has to satisfy certain properties. But the lifting concept is the interesting part, because if we can do that, we can compose everything also for our authenticated data structures. Now, for the data structures, we don't only have a single functor, we have several. So we have the functor for the data, which has atoms and which, we have, which builds constructed values on top of that. And then we want to talk about hashes, so this will be a functor fh um, of those digests. And naturally, if we have a way to compute digests for uh, atoms, we want to have a way to compute digests for um, complicated values. And here's the assumption that I mentioned about symbolic cryptography. If we assume that there are no high hash collisions, we can assume that the digest function is injected. So we can essentially consider the data as being embedded into the digests. But of course, um, we don't know in practice whether we have a hash corresponds to some real world data or whether someone just sent us garbage. So digests in general contain more values. Uh, like hash and dollar, and accordingly the trees and built on top of them as well. And finally, there's um, inclusion proofs. Now, fm is a bifunctor because it takes two inputs. Um, it contains a sub inclusion proof and digests of inclusion proofs or digests of data if these uh, parts are not blinded. And as before, if we have a hash function going from include atoms uh, on atoms, we get one on the complicated values, and the same for the merge. And once we have all these defined, we then want to prove the preservation lemma, saying, well, if we have the Merkle interface on those operations at the top, then the functor construction preserves these properties at the bottom. So, by stuffing together those things, we get a compositional approach. How does that look like for the Merkle tree construction? So in a binary tree, um, we have this with a leaf and a node. But for what comes, it will be useful to consider the case where we just have a single constructor, B tree, and the disjunction being replaced by a sum, and the pair of arguments being uncarried into a pair. So far, this type doesn't have any indication of where do we want to do authentication. So let's introduce another type to actually mark that at every position in the tree, we want to be able to uh, say, OK, here we're cutting off an inclusion proof. We're only focusing on one part in, in there. And once we have that, the rest is systematic. So. What we're going to do is we're replacing every type constructor in here with a subscript h to get the type of hashes. But again, this is a data type. And for the inclusion proofs, we do the same, except that the type construction becomes a tiny bit more complicated because this is a bifunctor. And that also systematically translates into uh, the operations that we want to prove. So if we want to define the hash function on the binary trees, well, you don't have to read everything. But the important part is that, again, you see down here the systematic construction. So every type constructor becomes essentially something that we compose here. 
And ultimately we take the least fixed point, defining it as a recursive function um, because we have a data type. And a merge function is essentially the same. Structurally, uh, works very nice. And the uh, preservation proof goes in the same direction. So how to do that modularly, how to get there is basically, we need a few building blocks. Um, here we have a data type, we have some products, and we have introduced this blindable thing. So what is this blindable? So suppose we have already built some type of data. I want to say, okay, at this point, we want to mark uh, this as a position that we can either include, prove inclusion of or not. So what the type synonym does is it basically puts a bo box around that. Now, the hash version, the digest, accordingly, we assume that for the atoms, we've already transformed them into digests using the hash function. What blindable H now does is it replaces this um, single node with the construction that we've seen, but when we computed that as this is the hash of uh, the concatenation of the two leaves. But we could also just have garbage here. So we're adding another case for garbage. And for the inclusion proof, well, if we want to prove inclusion of two and have replaced that part, well, then we can either say, okay, we want to prove, take this sub-inclusion proof into a larger thing, and then this position itself is not blinded. Or we can say, okay, yeah, this is just a hash and we're not going to drill into the details here, uh, in which case it's, it's a hash. So that's the, the core part, that's the implementation, and of course it preserves our interface. The second part, it's essentially those products and sums and function spaces if you want to have further branching. Um, and that's fairly simple. It's just pointwise lifting of operations um, because cryptographically these things aren't, aren't doing much. So we, we don't get much. Interesting to note, the order that we get on the lattice or the order transformation on the semi-lattice is just a relator of the associated uh, of the functor um, that we're looking at here. So for those who are interested in that. And the third part um, is data is data types are least fixed points. A binary tree is the least fixed point of uh, this functor, either a leaf or two recursive occurrences wrapped in blindable. So doing the replacement with um, H and M here as well, we get those definitions here. And those definitions are well defined because up here, we know that we're taking a least fixed point of a bounded natural factor, which is the theoretical underpinning for the data type pathogen Isabel. And we do also we're doing recursion through this blindable type constructor. Well, the blindable H and the blindable M themselves are again bounded natural factors and therefore um, we stay within this class where we can do recursion through and, and do our fixed point. And of course, we want our usual preservation theorem. So we do the least fixed point for the function of for defining hashes and the least fixed point for merge. And we want those to, uh, to have that property if the functor originally preserved everything, because then things work out nicely. Problem is that this theorem is wrong. Um, the reason is the Merkle interface, as I've shown you, isn't really inductive, so we can't uh, prove that theorem with induction. Um, what we did in the paper is to actually generalize it, um, to make it inductive, to prove that uh, the existing things, so the existing building blocks satisfy the generalization, and this is what we call the class of Merkle functors. And then there's a the proof that, well, those Merkle functors are actually closed under composition at least fixed points, which is what we set out for. And that gives us the idea of, okay, all data types over sums and products and function spaces in, co in, in well, in covariant positions are um, transformable in such a way such that we get systematically these, these types defined. For Canton, 
Um, so this was the transaction tree. Um, in reality, it's a bit more complicated. We have metadata and data for each view, and the view is such a gray box here. And then there's essentially here the recursion through the list type constructor. Um, so we have an arbitrarily branching tree here, and the transaction as a whole adds just more metadata. If you count things, we have two fixed points here that we have to go through and 12 compositions. And if we had to do that manually, we would probably be uh, still uh, trying to find out what is the correct definition. Whereas a systematic approach gives you all that for free. I haven't talked much about uh, how to actually create inclusion proofs, but there's actually a nice theory about that as well. Details are in the paper. Um, very simple example, if we have data and want to focus on this subtree of two and three, to get this inclusion proof down at the bottom, what you can do is you can construct a zipper that focuses on the position that you want to um, prove inclusion of. Um, that decomposes everything with those one whole context that summarize the context of the tree. It's fairly straightforward to blind those and replace uh, the zipper context with hide everything except um, the one whole context and then reassemble everything and you get back this tree here at the bottom. That gives you um, an inclusion proof for one position. If you need several positions in one inclusion proof, you can construct, well, first for each position one and then use the merge operation to merge them together. And that's just one example where the power of merge shows up. So in summary, um, I've talked about how to think of authenticated data structures as functors. Um, the whole thing has been formalized in Isabel and it's available in the AFP. So what we've done more precisely is we can't do mechanize the meta theory uh, if we want to go for a shallow embedding. So what we've done is we formalized the abstract theorems uh, with an axiomatized uh, functor. And then uh, essentially copy and pasted uh, those developments to respectively 12 times. Um, to get, the implementa uh, to get the implementation for the Canton transaction structures. One could automate that, but we haven't yet spent the effort on that. And of course, that's the first step towards formalizing um, the whole world of Daml and Canton and actually reasoning about the protocol and not just the data structures used fairly internally. In terms of future work, so we'd like to get rid of the uh, assumption that there are no hash collisions and rather make that, them explicit in the theorems. We have a few ideas around that, but it's unclear how much more complicated the proofs will get. And the current modeling is also not really suitable to reason about confidentiality. So it's fine to reason about authentic, authenticity of the data. Uh, and this is what mostly the inclusion proofs are about. Um, so for proving integrity for the protocol, this will be enough. If we want to talk about privacy and confidentiality, um, we will need to uh, extend the formalization. Thank you. Any questions? Well, then we have time for one question, I think. I'd have one about the injectivity assumption and uh, the, the one of the last points you mentioned. So in uh, the work uh, that we formalized the last ITP with the deep embedding, um, we followed uh, Milas et al. Uh, Popol paper from 2014, and they were careful not to assume that the hash functions are injected. Uh, and then basically what, what happens is that your final statement has the form, okay, either everything went according to plan, everybody has executed the protocol correctly, or there has been a hash collision, and here is the concrete hash collision that happened. But I guess with the Shallow embedding, you don't have the notion of executing the authenticated data structure at all, such that you well, cannot. There's, 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 no, there's no notion, no, ex, no, 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 no computational model underneath. I agree. Mm -hmm. But what one could still construct is the reduction that you mentioned like, well, either we have the right properties or here we can pinpoint to one hash collision that we've built, 
similarly how you would uh, do a reduction-based security proof. So the stuff that people in EasyCrypt or CryptHole uh, do, where they also don't have an underlying execution model. And then, of course, it, uh, it's the job of uh, the one who looks at the theorem to make sure that um, you're only using a computable uh, definition to uh, figure out what the hash collision was. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Thanks.